Um, so, I, I, as I recall from from the end of the talk yesterday, whenever Agnes's last talk was, um, it she talked about how we want to understand the K and local category, and how using the the sort of chromatic fracture square to understand Ln local homotopy theory out of Lkn and Ln minus 1, we reduce to understanding sort of what's happening in an infinitesimal neighborhood of a height n point in the moduli of formal groups. So that's where I want to start. I'm going to start with that like algebraic geometry question of what does it mean to talk about a deformation of the of a uh, height and a point. Um, so I'm going to define a category. Let's we'll say, um, let's say K is a field, uh, a characteristic P. And actually, the only ones I'm probably ever going to consider are are these. And um, I'm going to look at a ring. B, which is going to be a complete local ring, uh, with maximal ideal M, and I want the mod M to be my field. So if I'm in if I'm thinking in terms of algebraic geometry, and maybe it's not like complete, maybe it's actually just, uh, maybe M's a no potent ideal, which I guess is an example of complete, then the, the prime spectrum of both sides is the same. It's just spec K, but I have this no potent thickening around it. And so I can think of, of this as the difference between spec K and this as on points are the same, but I want to think of, of spec B as being uh, well, infinitesimally larger. So we'll define a category. <laughs> I'll still define a category. <laughs> F B of some formal group gamma, which sits over K, by saying the objects. Our uh, formal group laws G over B, such that when I uh, restrict B to the the fiber over K, so Q over star G, I exactly get gamma. You hear my Q took me from B down to B mod M, which was K. And then the morphism in this category is going to be a groupoid. So the uh, morphisms from G to some F are the uh, isomorphisms. from G to F, such that if I restrict the mod M, I get the identity. So they're isomorphisms of my formal group laws over, over gamma. Uh, okay, so the kind of miraculous Result here the theorem of movement and hate and that is that this groupoid is actually discrete so f b gamma is uh, a discrete groupoid so in other words the automorphisms of any point are just the trivial group. And uh, the object functor is 
is represented in the, the representing set. Is represented, you know, say representable. In fact, if I think about what the deformations, yeah. Yeah. this ends up being a set m to the k minus, one, excuse me, h minus one. So we're now h is the height of the amount. One of the nice features about working in this integral rate case, as opposed to just looking at the, the Arden local ring case, is that by represented, I mean it's represented by a complete local ring and continuous homomorphisms out of that complete local ring into B are then the same thing as my, my isomorphism classes of deformations of my formal group. So that's the statement here. And then what's the representing object? So well, it follows from, from knowing that the, the exactly this, that the value at some b is m to the height minus one, the representing ring is this ring all right, E zero. This is the universal deformation of my field to characteristic zero. So this is the deformation to characteristic zero. And then I'm going to join a bunch of uh, formal power series generators. U1 to U H minus one. Uh, if you're not as familiar with this, then this universal deformation of to zero, what's it do to FP itself? Well, I want to deform FP into character to zero. And I'm going to do it by, instead of saying P equals zero, I'm going to say some power of P equals zero, and I'm going to let that power go to infinity. So right on the inverse limit of the defining system, Z mod P to the N, and this is the P matrix, which um, does have the property that P is not uh, neopotent, but it's topologically so. And if I was doing F P to the N, Well, then I can choose lifts so that this looks like the piatics, and then I'm going to join to this a root of unity, where zeta to the p to the n minus 1 is 1. So in other words, I'm lifting the defining property. Remember, for a finite field, the uh, multiplicative group of its cyclic, and I'm choosing a representative of that cyclic group. And otherwise, it looks like that p. I just lifted that. OK, so saying that this is the representing ring says that there actually needs to be a deformation of gamma over this. Well, first, the maximal ideal is the maximal is the ideal generated by p and the ui's. And when I reduce modulo p and the ui's, then I exactly get um, the field k back. And the the a consequence of the theorem is that there is a universal deformation uh, gamma over oops that's a bad name gamma tilde over e zero such that any I'm going to say given any deformation uh, g over some b, we have a, a continuous homomorphism 
E0 to B, and G is uh, isomorphic in the above sense. It's called star isomorphic. So I'll add that a sec to the pullback along F at the Amatilla. This is again just a restatement of Lubin and Tate's theorem that this that this set, this discrete groupoid, is representable. So we're going to use that in a couple of ways. So once I know that this is representable, then I can start asking about naturality of this. And so um, anyone point out any questions? Yeah. The number of power series generators is that. This is the same H as the height. It's the same H as the height, exactly. Yeah, this looks like an N, but it's actually an H. Um, yes. So the missing one is the move to character to zero. Any other questions? Okay. is try to navigate the racing. <laughs> In hindsight, I should have said, any questions while well, I was doing this? <laughs> How's your week going? <laughs> yeah, mine too. Pretty nice. Uneventful. I'm in Germany. Things are a little different here. <laughs> I have a question. What are, what are the marks that are made for? <laughs> Um, I don't know. I assumed you put them there, Paul. Carefully, did not erase them. I did because I didn't write them. <laughs> so I feel like they're trying to tell me something. Maybe it's if I were to write above this, then people on the, the video can't see. In which case, I should probably just start writing everything above that mark. No, I don't know. I don't know. Um, Let's see, where am I? Okay. Here. Um, all right. So I can extend this from E0, being this ring just concentrated in degree zero, to, let's try one more, to a zero ring. So I'll let E star be E0 adjoin an invertible parameter U where the degree of U is minus 2. And I can also extend the, uh, the formal group, the universal deformation over this. So I can extend the, um, the universal to a homogeneous and formal group law over E star. And the, the way we normally do this is you just do something like uh, take my formal group law, uh, which I've noted gamma tilde, and it was a formal group law of two variables. And um, I left space not because um, of terrible kerning, but because I want to insert my parameter in a couple of places. And then uh, come on, I still have And if I've done this right, uh, if I put the u's in the right spot rather than the u inverses, then the whole thing becomes homogeneous to degree two. 
And what this means is that I can, I have a nice homogeneous formal group law. These are classified by maps from the graded Lazard ring from MU star. So associated to this, I have a map MU star into E star that classifies this. And it has the, the property that if I look at what happens to, say, the P series, so with a choice of the UIs, the P series of this formal group law. Well, that looks like oops, P of X is PX uh, plus over gamma tilde with something like U1 X to the P plus gamma tilde U2 x to the t squared, and so on, until I get to uh, u h minus 1, x to the p h minus 1, plus x to the p h. Can I, oops, I forgot a bunch of gamma tilde's. And I also forgot that at this point, I need to fix gamma. Sorry about that. Gamma is uh, on the formal group law, which is the one that's classified by uh, vi went to zero. <coughs> in fp uh, if i is not h <coughs> and the h <coughs> went to one okay sorry for that omission so when i have this this map from the lazard ring into e star and I was able to choose my deformation parameters so that I was exactly deforming the P-series. And the reason that I was like, oh gosh, I should have mentioned that I was in the Honda formal group law, is the P-series for the Honda formal group law, by the way that I can define the VIs, is, is just P of X is X to the P to the H. And so in this sense, the P-series is reflecting the way that I'm deforming my formal group law. Instead of saying that P, which is where the very first thing would have been, well, was zero, that's what happened in FP. It doesn't have to be zero anymore. It's just P, which is some you know, topological equivalent thing. But then I also have possibility for these lower heights. If one of the UIs, if P were not, if P were a unit, all of a sudden, this would be, well, it would be rational. So maybe that's a bad example. But if P were zero and, and U1 was a unit, then this becomes a height one theory. So it's the sense in which I'm deforming my formal group law from something that had height H down, I'm smearing it over all of the heights that came before. And this is the, this is exactly that. Pushing it, sort of perturbing it into the, the L H minus one localization for that part of the, that open substack. Okay, so the VIs play a second role in this. First, the VIs go under this, just so it looks sort of like the UIs up to, up to a unit. And so this, this lets me deduce that I actually get a homology theory. So I'm going to define E star of x by 
E star tensor over MU star with MU star of X. And as written, this is just uh, this is just a functor from from say spaces into graded abelian groups. But there's a wonderful result this due to Land Weber. And that is that if we're localized at a prime, and if the sequence P, V1, and so on is a regular sequence, uh, in some ring, our star that's under M U star, then this construction is a homology theory. Normally I worry in these cases that, um, that I'm trying to take a homology theory and then I'm base changing it to some other ring in general, like an arbitrary ring under MU star isn't going to be flat. And so I worry that when I replace uh, MU star, my exact sequences that define a homology theory, with the tensor product with R, that it fails to be exact anymore. And then we showed that no, nope. in fact, uh, they stay flat, or Flat enough, it's flat in sort of a stacky sense, and the exact sequences behind the homology here stay exact. Okay, so I'm gonna just finish drawing. Ooh, any questions? Never <laughs> <laughs> remember this time. So, um, the fact that you use characteristic zero is related to the fact that one does blackness here yeah, or, or uh, could you repeat that please? The, the, the flatness of E star over mu star is related to the fact that you went to characteristic zero. Yeah. yeah. You're not working there. Right. Right. I need I mean the, it becomes the very initial piece that I need multiplication by P in my ring to be a non-zero divisor. And then, so that pushed me, as you said, I had to do more of the characteristic zero. The, the map that classifies the Honda form of law fails to satisfy this for any height, exactly for that reason. And anything over a finite field will fail to satisfy this. Um, you may also think I have a ring with only sort of H parameters counting P as the first one, and yet I have an infinite sequence that I'm claiming is a regular sequence um, and the way that this works is that at some point as I'm forming the quotients I end up multiplying by a unit so that the, the next ring so a regular sequence is like each one is not a zero divisor mod all the previous ones if mod all the previous ones gives me the zero ring then, then I win and from that point on I don't have to worry everything it turns out every element is not a zero divisor in the zero ring uh, <laughs> because they're all units. Um, okay, so I have this homology theory. It's like uh, this, and this goes by a couple of names. So E star, uh, let E be the associated spectrum. And this is sometimes called uh, Morava E theory. And it's sometimes also called Lubin E theory. Um, and Morava E theory, because a lot of the story is, was pioneered by work of Jack Morava in the 70s, and Lubin-Tate theory because it's a lift to spectra of the Lubin-Tate deformation theory. Okay, 
So now I want to, to put in some of the, the action of the automorphisms of the, say, Honda formal group law. So let's look at the the endomorphisms over, say, fp to the n, I'm going to extend up a little. The Honda formal group law was defined over fp, and I'm going to work over fp to the n of my gamma, which is the Honda. Maybe I'll call it gamma n, if I want to keep track of uh, which. Oh, and I switched, sorry, these should both be h's. I want to keep my notation consistent. Uh, so, remember, what does it mean to be an endomorphism of this formal group law? Well, this means that I'm looking at a power series, and the power series uh, has constant term zero. There's a power series in Y. Oh, dang it. There we go. And it satisfies that um, F of x plus over gamma h, y, is f of x plus over gamma h, uh, f of y. Different y, right? Uh, yes. Yeah. Ooh. Oh, that's awful. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I don't have polite words to express frustration. <laughs> Hoping to learn about it here. Okay, um, so let me give an example of one of these, and this is an important one because I'm defined over FP. Well, when I'm defined over FP, all of the coefficients when I write down my power series in two variables that define gamma n were these were coefficients in fp. So in particular, the pth power map acts as the identity on all the coefficients, and it's a ring homomorphism on power series. So in example one, I'll call s y. This is y to the p. And s also has the property that if I do s of y, if I do s h times, then I get y to the p to the h, and this was the p series on y. And we had other endomorphisms, or any form of one, maybe multiplication by, by like an integer. And so we're reflecting the fact that these are abelian group objects in some sense. And so I also have multiplication by, uh, oh, write it as like a scalar multiplication by, um, I'll just say elements A in F P B H. And so the main structural result here is that these <coughs> two kinds of of endomorphisms actually completely describe this ring. So we have a map from the universal deformation to characteristic zero of F E P H. And then I join to this a non-commuting variable S. This is the uh, non-commutative polynomials. And then I put in a couple of relations. The relations I put in are reflecting. Well, the first one is that s to the h is the same thing as multiplication by p. And this was giving me, by the way, these scalar multiples. And then the other thing is, if I scalar multiply and then raise to the p power, that's the same thing as raising to the p power and scalar multiplying by the, well, the Frobenius shift of what I did. So if I did SA 
this is the Frobenius shift of A times S. And this is the endomorphism. Oops, these are H's. And these were all the endomorphisms. And I can also describe the automorphisms that are the units in this. We've seen this before. Um, this is actually a valuation ring. It's a, uh, it's, the, it's a maximal order, so the ring of integers in a division algebra over over QP. The division algebras over QP are parameterized by an element of Q mod Z called the Hansen variant. And these are the elements of Hansen invariant uh, 1 over n. Where n equals h. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> 1 over h. <clears throat> Any other questions? Yeah, I'm a little confused about your scalar modifications. You say A is an F P to the H, but then you yeah. go into bit back and say. Yeah. Any other questions? <laughs> uh, no, what I get to do is I get to use the fact that when I'm over something like F P to the N, I have this action not just of the integers given by you think, but I can actually extend that action to an action of the piatics. And then, so for my formal uh, group law, like the Honda formal group law, I can make sense of power series where I, you know, a convergent power series in P, so a piatic power series. That allows me, ignoring the, the roots of unity part, that allowed me to not just get an action of Z, which is what I probably think, but actually get an action of the chiatics. And then I have so to- So you're doing a type with a lift of A. Yeah, okay. yeah, but I'm deliberately not naming him. Good, okay. <laughs> um, so I'm doing a multiplicative lift of yeah. F, P, yeah. and in. Exactly, thank you. Um, any other questions? Okay. So I'm going to let, uh, let S8 be the automorphism of gamma H, which then sits in here. And it's not hard to see what these look like. They basically are the things that when I reduce mod P, or really reduce mod S, I get a, a, an element of F P T H cross. And then and um, so people sometimes call this the Morava Stabilizer group. And then I can extend this by the fact that my original thing was defined not over FP to the H, but rather over just FP, so I can keep track of the action of the Galois group. Of F P H over F P and put down a bigger group. Now, uh, these by by definition, they're acting on on gamma. So I have I can do the following construction. So choose any lift. Of some power series. So F, which on the one hand was in, I'll just do it for the more stable group. That's H. To a power series in um, the universal deformation character to zero of F E T H. Now also a join. A power series generator. 
and I can act. So my Lubin Tate ring, in fact, the, the deformations that I was looking at, they were acted on by, by this. So now twist. Our universal deformation. Uh, by this this unnamed method. So I'll take my gamma tilde and send it to F tilde inverse gamma F tilde F tilde. And these remember gamma took two arguments. So I made it to do this. Now the way I built this is trace through. So if I reduce this mod the maximal ideal, that includes reduction mod p. Reducing this mod p took me down to f. f was an automorphism of my formal group law gamma h. The reduction mod the maximal ideal of gamma tilde was gamma h. And if I trace through this, since this is an automorphism, then what I've done is I've said, take my automorphism inverse and apply it to taking my automorphism. So this actually lifts the identity when I did this. Oh, but lifting the identity, that's the same thing as saying that I had a star isomorphism class. That meant that this was another, another deformation of the Honda formal group law. So this gives me a right action <coughs> of Sn on uh, the deformations. Oh, it's H, excuse me. And so the right action on the, the represented functor is the same data as the left action. On E theory. Just the, <coughs> the ring. Now I get to actually um, do a little more algebraic geometry. seconds ago, probably not. But, <laughs> so what I'm going to move to is what's called Galois descent. So I have the basic setup I can describe without writing. I find it uh, helpful to not have to write anything. And the, the key idea is to consider the pair consisting of the real numbers and then its algebraic closure to complex numbers. And the question that I want to answer is, how can I rebuild the data of a real vector space if the only thing I have to work with are complex vector spaces? So I have the complexification map, which gives me an embedding of real vector spaces into complex vector spaces. But then it's, it's kind of unnatural to actually like find a way to rebuild my real vector space out of a complex vector space because you know okay what am I what would I imagine doing I'll choose a basis okay we all know that's kind of that's super unnatural and if I chose a different basis like say multiply every basis vector by i then I guess something that looks pretty different than what I started with. Traditional Galois descent says what I'm supposed to do is I'm supposed to remember that if I complexify a real vector space, then complex conjugation acts 
on the complexification. And it doesn't act in a complex linear way, because it's complex conjugation. <laughs> it acts in a complex conjugate linear way on this. And if I remember complex vector spaces together with the data of an involution that's conjugate linear, then I get an equivalence of categories between real vector spaces and complex vector spaces plus vector gap. This is, is descent. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to play the descent game, but instead of the real numbers, I'm going to use the k and mobile sphere. And instead of the complex numbers, I'm going to use e theory. It's like totally the same. <laughs> because I have a group that's acting. That's literally the glue that's going to hold this together. And then I'll describe some of the pieces that go along the way to actually make this uh, less just a heuristic and more uh, mathematics. I think they'll uh, get me, uh, ideally, if I kind of right, I'll like answer this to the, to the Picard group. OK, so first I need uh, a theorem. This is due to what's uh, talking Schiller. And it says that, in fact, um, I can extend, so the loop and hate theories uh, have the structure of an E infinity ring. And this action that we see here, so the SH action on E star lifts to an action uh, by oops, an action, yeah, by E infinity ring now. Uh, this group. In fact, they show a, a much stronger statement than the one I'm using here in that I didn't have to choose. I could have had any perfect field and finite height form a group over that perfect field, and I lift and I get the automorphism. It's a really pretty story. If you're not familiar with the, what I mean by the infinity ring, um, then it's a commutative monoid in, say, orthogonal spectrum, just as Stefan was talking about. And it's one of the reasons we like these nice uh, categories of diagram spectra. These classical notions like E infinity collapse down to it's just a commutative ring, a commutative monoid object with a smash product in that category. And this is saying that that action uh, was the shadow in homotopy of an actual action by a commutative ring maps. And then I have a unit map, which went from the k and local sphere to E theory. I'm calling it the unit map because E theory, oops, this is an H. Because E theory is kh local. So the usual unit map, a map from the symmetric Noether unit, the zero sphere, factors canonically through the kh localization. And this is going to be a kind of a kind of Galois extension. And it's Galois in the sense of broadness. So what does that mean? Well, Devinitz and Hopkins showed us that given this action by commuted ring maps, I can form the homotopy fixed points for either S, N, or really I can form it with uh, a little more care with this larger group where I extend by the Galois action. And these are commutative rings because these were the fixed points for the action by commutative ring maps. And if I consider the unit there, LKN of the zero sphere, mapping into this, and this is an equivalent. 
So I can think of this as saying I can rebuild that can local sphere or or for something finite, something can local out of E theory, out of this movement T theory, provided I remember additional data, the same kind of descent data that I needed. Uh, oh, I need to catch names. Say, I don't know. So, if you're familiar with sort of the Galois theory of rawness, or if you're not familiar with it, if you're familiar with the Galois theory of ordinary rings, or maybe if you're not familiar with that, if you're familiar with the Galois theory of fields, which um, if you're anything like me is what got you into math to begin with, um, then, then you'll notice that this condition, this bottom condition, is like saying that my ground field is the fixed points of the bigger field when I take the, the action of the Galois group. So here the Murata stabilizer group is playing the role of the Galois group, the Galois theory. There's a different condition, which if we're fields, we're going to call these like normal and separable. But I can write them in a kind of coordinate free way. And the coordinate free way involves asking how do I make sense of the E theory of E theory? This is my field tensor with itself. Now, I should be K and local. I want to stay K and local. And there's a horrible feature that smashing two K and local things, there's no reason to believe that it's K and local. Um, secretly, you already knew this. If I take the P addicts and I tensor them with the P addicts, um, that has an uncountable rational vector space sitting inside there that we just never think about. <laughs> <laughs> and we never think about it because when we do the p addicts tensor the p addicts, we then re p complete. And so I'm going to do the same thing here. And every time I write smash product, henceforth, oops, h, then I should always take in the kh localization. And if I forget to write it, then tell me you forgot to write the kh localization. So the corresponding Galois theoretic result is that this, this commutative ring is the same thing as the space of continuous maps from the Miranda Stabilizer group in E theory. And here I have sort of two actions that I could use. Oh, the way that I'm going to build this is it's the, it's again an idea from Galois theory. Let's ignore the continuous for now. If I adjoint this over, this is saying for every element of the group, I'm supposed to produce a kind of pairing from E tensor E back to E. What I'm going to do is I'm going to twist the second factor via the automorphism of E theory by a ring maps. And then I get to do that for all of my automorphisms. And that produced a map from here to here. And this is an equivalence. This is some sort of separability statement. Uh, I think it's separability and normality. Right. Uh, yeah. It's saying that I have enough automorphisms and that my automorphisms like separate yeah. points. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so this condition is the is the the other part of Galois. So if you've never seen Rognes and his Galois theory, it's a really beautiful story that says that we can do actually a lot of the Galois theory from algebra in spectra. This is one of the prototypical examples. Okay, so now I want to continue the Galois descent story and, and look at, so uh, let's resolve any, uh, any and or K H local thing. And actually this is going to be wildly ambitious. So um, let's resolve <laughs> the K H local sphere. 
Because this one, it's exactly the, the sense story that I started with. I'm going to take the cage local sphere, I'm going to tensor with E theory, and I'm going to build a resolution. So we start with E theory, I do E smash E, I do E smash E smash E, and I go on. And then I remember uh, the symmetrical product was actually the KH localization of this. So fine. And I have two maps here. There's include E as the left factor or include E as the right factor. And I have a map back that's multiply. And I have three maps here where I insert the zero sphere either to the left in between them or to the right. Or I multiply the first two or multiply the second two. And I keep going. And so I've written down a cosimplicial object. And in fact, I've written out a cosimplicial object in KH local commutative rings. This is um, in algebra called the Amitsur complex that I'm describing how do I get my ground ring out of the descent data. But from the descent, what was this? This was my, my ring E, and then I was remembering this, this dual, well, right here, this dual story for the action of G on E. And the two maps are just include E in, or remember the dual to the action map of G on E. And I keep resolving. So if I apply homotopy to this, <coughs> it's going to give me a spectral sequence. Which, to paraphrase, uh, I guess even more directly here is literally what we do for a living. <laughs> and the spectral sequence is, is the one that's built out of, I take E theory, and I'm re resolving E star, but in the category of modules with an action of G. This is like the co-freed up version of the G action on E star. This is the G cross G, maps out of G cross G into E star. This whole thing is the, the complex that you write down when you compute group cohomology in a continuous sense. So with E2, the cohomology of G H coefficients in pi T of E theory. And the descent story is that this converges to the homotopy groups of the KH local sphere. And there are lots of names that go along with this. This kind of, uh, that this should be true is sort of the vision of Morava, where he was observing that when we're looking at the KH local sphere, if I write down the Adams Novikov spectral sequence, so Take the same story, and instead of resolving by E theory, resolve by complex boredism. And that gives you a different spectral sequence, the Adams Novikov spectral sequence. And he pointed out that when I'm doing something to get like the KH local sphere, then the Adams Novikov E2 term collapses down to this group cohomology computation. So it's like a pure algebra statement that Morava noticed. And then there when it's a Hopkins. Uh, made this precise. And we got this homotopy fixed point spectral sequence. Ah, uh, took us here. Okay, so some things to note about this, because this is saying if I want to understand KH local homotopy, at least for say compact things or finite things or things built out of a sphere in finitely many pieces, I'll get to pick in a minute. Then I need to understand what was the action of the Morava stabilized group on this Lubin eight theory? You need to understand the differentials in the spectral sequence. Okay, so a couple of people from this group. In which category did you resolve the thing local here? Uh, where is everything taking place? In fact, every one of these maps is a map of KH local commutative rings. 
So this is a co-simplicial KH local commuter degree. But from the point of view of the spectral sequence, what I actually need is that it's a, a just a, a co-simplicial KH local spectrum. I don't even need KH local. Any other questions? Okay. If H equals one, so I'm looking at things of height one, like say the multiplicative formal group, then my understanding is that in the problem session, you actually worked out what the endomorphisms and the automorphisms were, and you saw that in that case, the Morava stabilizer group collapsed down to the PI units. So we know what the action of, oh, and the Galois group of FP over FP is also one that we can pretty easily work with. The identity is my favorite and the only automorphism they have to worry about. So the, there's no difference between G1 and H1, and it's this copy of the p units. So if P is odd, then this has finite cohomological degree. There's a copy of the p sitting inside here, and the p have cohomologic height 1, or cohomology degree 1. I said if the P had to be odd for that to be true, and that's because if I did the two attic units, well, it's that like weird feature that, that minus 1 is an integer and a square root of unity. Um, there aren't a lot of other roots of unity that are like, it's hard to have p roots of unity in Kerstie, or sorry, in Kerstie, in the p attics and not be ramified. But I can add two with the square root of unity. So I have a copy of the cohomology of z mod two, or of the sigma of order two, and that has infinite cohomology dimension. So the thing that, that puts these all together is that these groups, we all stick with that as H's, this has um, virtual cohomology dimension n squared. And in fact, it's a Poincare duality uh, group virtually. Is that what it would like? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, it's clearly from the yeah, yeah, it's thank <laughs> you. And it's a, a virtual Poincare duality. That's not a capital T. <laughs> and the other thing that we know is that um, it doesn't have a whole lot of finite subgroups. The finite subgroups. We know a lot of other things, but these are things I'll mention. Uh, finite subgroups are the form. Well, it looks like a cyclic group of order p to the sum r. And then it's. <laughs> <laughs> M <laughs> to, to disambiguate. <laughs> and then I have some uh, prime to P cyclic group. And this is, uh, I want P to be the prime I fix, and it's not going to be 2. If P is 2, then in certain cases I also have quaternionic groups. And the only time I have this. <coughs> So this happens uh, if and only if uh, p the m minus one times p minus one divides h. So in other words, if I can find, say, uh, if adjoining a p to the m root of unity to the to q p is an extension that sits inside my maximal order. There's no restriction on the Um If I'm, 
being careful, there is no N. No. Oh, the, uh, the, no, the, the L's are also pretty tightly bound. Um, they correspond to basically uh, various roots of unity that sit inside unramified extensions of QP, whose degree divides H. Whereas the, the Z mod PDMs correspond to ramified extensions. So does L always divide P minus 1? Uh, no, it can be bigger than the P minus 1. I think if I'm not wrong, the largest L can be, like the largest Z mod L can be, is the automorphism for Z mod P. Yeah. I don't remember. I'll think about it afterwards. Okay. Um, ooh. So, I didn't get a chance to talk about the Picard group. I think I'm out of time. So, sorry about that. Um, but, you can see where I, maybe you can see the place where I was going to be going. I'm going to, probably not. The whole story says that I can use descent to understand KH local phenomena, replacing them with equivariant E theory computations. Stefan told us a lot about the Picard group of various equivariant setups. In particular, I see a bunch of things like the representation group sitting inside, or a mapping to there. Not necessarily onto, because it's no potent, but otherwise, we there's I'm just describing some elements. So I can try to use things like the techniques in equivariant homotopy to start studying, well, both the this Adam Tanova of spectral sequence, which would be far too ambitious, because um, <coughs> it turns out that most profinite groups are in fact not finite. Um, but then I can also restrict to these finite cases to try and understand elements in pick there. And so if I been um, if I gone in unnecessary speed, that's where I would have ended. So <laughs> tell her that I did, and this isn't recorded. <laughs> okay. Great.